السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His household, his companions We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them To bless every one of us and to grant us every form of goodness Ameen My beloved brothers and sisters When a person falls ill Immediately many people would actually think to themselves let me take a little bit of medication. Let me see what I could do. Let me perhaps have something that I might have within the house. And inshallah, I'll feel better very soon. And then they find that they're not getting better. And so what happens is they think to themselves, let me visit the doctor or let me speak to someone else. And they either visit the doctor or speak to a professional. And what would happen at that particular time, they feel reassured within themselves when the doctor diagnoses the problem they have and tells them that you need to have this medication or that medication. It is prescribed and mashallah, they would make their way to the pharmacy or wherever they're going to get that medication and they will start the course. And psychologically, they begin to feel that they're having something and they may even give a bit of feedback to the doctor to say, I'm feeling worse, I'm feeling better, etc. There comes a time when even that doesn't help. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows a believer to go through certain stages at times is in order for us to realize that the mistake was right at the beginning. The minute we fall ill, the minute calamity strikes, the first thing we need to do is turn to Allah. So many times a day we repeat, you alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. I will worship Allah alone and I will ask for Allah for help. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then facilitate for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then facilitate for me and grant me the ability to do that which is correct, to do that which is filled with blessing from every angle. There is no point in being cured medically and physically when spiritually we are ill, we are sick, when religiously we are far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So mankind due to his weakness starts off on the wrong side by relying primarily upon the medication or the doctor or whoever else it may be or himself or his expertise or whatever he's read or knows and nowadays even on Google subhanallah so you find Allah is removed from the equation and this is where we falter the difference between a believer and one who does not believe is that the believer primarily turns to Allah before everything we say bismillah we are taught that when you leave the house, you say Bismillahi, tawakkaltu ala Allah. In the name of Allah, I lay my trust in Allah. And we would lock the door. Thereafter, whatever you're doing, if it is anything of importance, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Kullu amalin lam yabda fihi bi Bismillahi fa huwa aqba. Anything that you're going to do, if you haven't started it with Bismillah, it is going to be cut, chopped. Chopped means the blessing of it, the reward of it, the goodness of it, even if Physically, you achieved some form of success because you removed Allah from the equation. That was the mistake you made and therefore the blessing will be snatched away. The goodness is snatched away. You and I know that we're going through trying times. Trying times, not just because of the virus that has overtaken the globe, but people are losing jobs. People are struggling with anxiety. People are struggling with a lot of difficulty and hardship. People are struggling in such a way that they're losing their loved ones and their properties and a lot of other things. Subhanallah. I know of people who've recovered from the virus, but they have other health issues. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them mercy. May Allah make it easy for them and for all of us. I mean, we turn to Allah and Allah at times makes every plan that we have fail because we haven't added him into the equation and we haven't put him into it yet. So place Allah in your equation. We ask Allah. And when we ask Allah, Allah allows us indeed and he requires from us that we do whatever he has placed within our capacity to do to achieve what we believe is beneficial. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ says, Work hard towards what you believe is beneficial for you. Then leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I would like a job, I cannot, I need to strike a balance between two things. One is just to go out and look for a job and remove Allah from the equation without saying Bismillah, without making my uh, salaf, perhaps to make dua to Allah. Oh Allah, I'm going out today for a job. Make it easy for me. Let me get a job in a good place. Uh, help me to go to the right people. Help me with the right uh, you know, environment and so on. Then you go out. And when, the, when you go out, you actually are going to be guided by Allah. But if you removed Allah, like the one extreme, where people just go out and there is no Allah in the equation, they didn't do anything. In that case, there will be no barakah in the job. There will be no barakah in the surroundings. There will be no barakah in what you may earn because where is Allah, the owner of sustenance in your equation? He's supposed to be featuring number one there. 
And so the other extreme is those who say, I lay my trust in Allah. So after Salatul Fajr, I'm going to sit on the Musalla, perhaps do a little bit of dhikr, and then I will go to bed and recline up to Salat al-Dhuhr. And if it is meant, the job will come to me. Someone will miraculously know that I need a job and someone will miraculously bring the job here to me at home. That's the other extreme. It's called Tawakul. Tawakul and Tawakkul. There is a difference between the two that I will get to in a few moments. So a mu'min is one who strikes the balance. Everything we related to Allah and we thank him for giving us energy, a capacity, a brain, a mind, a system, an environment, a neighborhood, people whom we know or people whom we will get to know because we will make an effort after we say Bismillah in the name of Allah. I say in the name of Allah, then I make an effort to go to the masjid. I don't just sit back and relax and say, I'll get there if it was written. That's foolish. It is said that a man once came to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu or he was brought to Umar ibn Khattab as the Amir of the Mu'mineen. And he had stolen, so he was about to be punished. But he was a clever person. He says, Oh Umar, oh Amir al Mu'mineen, how can you punish me when it was written that I was going to steal? So Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu says very beautifully, he says, Well, it was written that we were going to punish you as well. Subhanallah. As simple as that. So you cannot blame the taqdeer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the predestiny of one thing that may have led to another thing when Allah gave you the capacity and the mind and the ability to do or not to do. If that was the case, there would be no point in any one of us fulfilling salah or any ibadah because Allah already knows who is going to go to Jannah and who is going to go to Jahannam. What's the point of doing deeds? Well, the point of doing deeds is you and I don't know where we are going to go. So Allah says, we've kept it a mystery for you, although we may know. That doesn't mean we imposed upon you not to do things. If you chose with the choice we gave you, Allah gave us a limited choice. If you use that limited choice in a way that was foolish, you pay the price. And this is why Allah is going to question and ask it would be unfair for anyone to ask you why you did something when they forced you to do it it would be very unjust but what is justice is when Allah has given you a limited choice and he asks you to use that choice in a beautiful way and you made an effort you strove to use that choice in a beautiful way then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would definitely question you how you used your choice and reward you for that which you chose which was good so at times a person falls ill and one thing didn't work, the next thing didn't work, the third thing didn't work, as intelligent as you thought you were. Speaking to the doctors with this crisis, many of them will confirm that they don't know what's going on at times. They've tried everything and they realize that, you know what, it's not in their hands. They can only try, but it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who grants the effect of the medication. That's true. Look at how many people having exactly the same medication for the same diagnosis. It works on some, it doesn't work on some. That is the power of Allah. Allah is just showing us how helpless we are and how he is. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. So what is of importance is for us to realize this balance. If you are true believers, then you would lay your trust in Allah in the correct sense. Subhanallah. What is the meaning of the correct sense? Tawakkul. We have a tashdeed on the calf. Tawakkul. Tawakkul means do whatever is in your capacity, God given capacity, Allah given capacity in order to ensure what you would like and lay your trust in Allah. Look at Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. When his father was speaking to his brothers and the brothers were going back to the palace of the minister in order to, uh, to get their rations. He says, oh, my sons, there are 11 of you. So many. I fear the evil eye. Subhanallah. I fear the evil eye. So if you're all going to enter from one gate and they see 11 handsome youngsters all looking similar, all walking through the same door, perhaps evil eye may affect you in one way or another. So what he says, he says, He says, oh, my children, don't enter from one door, enter from all separate doors. Let them not recognize that you're all part of one big family. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. And he says, you know what? I hold nothing. If Allah wills anything, I have nothing that will hold it back. But we obviously have to lay our trust. So he says, I have now laid my trust in Allah. He took his precautions by doing what? He told his children a few things. He says, look, I fear you might take this child, this other brother, and he might disappear. When they gave him the promises, and then he gave them advice how to enter the door and what to do. And then he said, now I've laid my trust in Allah. And he says, indeed, those who are the layers of trust should lay their trust only in him, in Allah. You want to lay your trust in someone, it should only be Allah. Ultimate trust is laid in Allah. 
We do know that if a little child looks at the parent, a little uh, person looks at someone bigger, uh, a person who's working for you looks at you as a boss or as a, when I say as a boss, I mean as someone who's slightly above them in authority or in wealth or whatever else, they say, look, I trust you and I know this. What they mean is, I only trust you within the limits that Allah has given you. Beyond that, it's Allah whom I ultimately trust for me and for you, subhanAllah. So Allah gives everyone a little capacity. If you take a look at Yusuf alayhi salam's story, it's amazing because right at the beginning, he tells his son, don't even narrate this dream to the others. Why? That's part of taking precautions. Subhanallah. Something bad will happen perhaps if you just relate this dream and guess what? Lo and behold, Allah wanted it to be. As much as he told his child, the innocent child told the brothers. And as a result, Subhanallah, there was the evil plot that was planned against him. But the lesson learned is, didn't he speak about it? Didn't the Yaqub alayhi salam say that, oh my son, don't narrate this dream to your own brothers as a precaution. Subhanallah. But Allah still let something happen. And one thing went wrong according to us, but it was not wrong according to Allah. The human mind looks at it as a negativity. That was the beginning of the positivity. Allah creates positives out of a negative. What seems negative to you is a positive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are a believer and you lay your trust in Allah, nothing can go wrong. Look at the battles when the Prophet ﷺ was in the battle of Uhud and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed so many verses. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us at the time of war, He says, those believers who took part in that war, Allah says, they were promised one of the two good things, ihdal husnayain, used in the Quran. One of two good things is going to happen to them. What are one of those two good things? You lay your trust in Allah. You either achieve victory, which is temporary in this world, or you achieve martyrdom, which is everlasting. Subhanallah. It is success. You're a believer. You don't look at it negatively. It's a trying time. It's a test. It's a difficulty. But amazing are the affairs of a true believer for indeed all his or her affairs are good. If something bad happens physically to us as we human beings would look at, we would consider it to be the decree of Allah. It was a good thing. We bear patience and the patience will result in us being rewarded immeasurably. And if something good according to us happened where we achieved what we thought we wanted to achieve as humankind, we make what is known as shukr. We thank Allah. We don't become haughty. We don't become arrogant. We don't become uh, people who think they're mighty and so on. We understand this was from Allah. It is also temporary, but Allah has given us this gift. And so we will become even closer to Allah. My brothers and sisters, when Allah gives you something, become closer to him. That's a sign of a believer. When Allah takes away something from you, become closer to him. That's a sign of a believer. When anything has happened to you, if it resulted in you coming closer to Allah, it was a gift of Allah. Be it positive or negative from a human perspective. And when anything drives you away from Allah, no matter how positive it looked like from a human perspective, it was very negative because it drifted you away from Allah. Perhaps it could be a punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So a true believer during trying times lays his or her trust solely and only in Allah to begin with understanding that Allah alone is in absolute control. Nothing happens except by the will of Allah. You should know that if the whole nation, all the people gather to benefit you by a little, they will never be able to benefit you unless Allah has written it for you. Look at the people who want to cure the sick and ill during this virus. If it is not meant to be, it will never happen. You can bring the top specialists with the top medications, with the top apparatus or machinery or whatever equipment they call it, whatever else it may be. If Allah has not written for you to be helped, it will not even say hello to you. Subhanallah. And if Allah has written for harm not to reach you, it will never reach you. The same hadith says, I'lam, you should know. If the entire nation, and according to one translation, if all the nations get together in order to harm you, with a small thing, they will not be able to harm you except by that which Allah has written against you. Now, does that mean I need to sit back and say, well, if Allah's written, it'll come. If Allah's not written, it won't come. Part of the plan of Allah is you need to use that God given, or like I said, Allah given capacity that you have to do your bit, either attempt to protect yourself to the best of your ability that was given by Allah. It doesn't mean that's denying the trust in Allah. We lay our full trust in Allah. Look at the Prophet Muhammad The battle of the trench was a great calamity. It was a test, a very trying time, difficult. The, the army was coming of the Meccans. But what did he do? He didn't just sit back. They dug a trench around a lot of Medina Munawwara in order to save or protect the Mu'mineen. They didn't just sit back and relax and say, you know what? I'm the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are Sahaba who are the highest of the lot, which is true. They didn't say, so now we're just going to sit back and wait and Allah will protect us. Yet Allah will definitely protect them. But Allah wants you to play a small bit and then say, you know what? Oh Allah, I'm so weak. I could only do X amount given, meaning by your 
by, by the energy you gave me, the ability you gave me, the common sense that you gave me, the logic that you gave me, I can only play a small role here. But you are the one who gave me that power in the first place, accept it from me and grant me the protection or whatever I am trying to achieve by your ultimate power. That's what it is. May Allah grant us ease. These are so many examples in the day to day lives of the prophets of Allah. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon all of them and the, and the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every day, this, you will find so many examples. Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu, when he came into Medina Munawwara as a person who had just made the hijrah, he was an intelligent businessman, but he had nothing with him. When people offered him half of their wealth and so on and so forth, his, you know, his own level refused to take a handout from someone, although it was not wrong. And you know what he says? He says, Duluni ala suq. Show me to the market. Where is the market here? Let's see where it is. He went to the market. At the end of that day, he came back with some profit. Subhanallah. What did he do? He obviously bought and sold. He did something and he made an effort. He went out. Subhanallah. That's why the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ speaks about sustaining people in hardship. The same way Allah sustains a bird. So many people who don't understand the difference between tawakkul and tawakul, they, they think for themselves, well, here's the hadith. Allah says, Law annakum ala Allahi haqqa tawakkulih, la razaqakum kama if you are to lay your trust truly in Allah, in the proper sense, he will feed you the way he feeds a bird. So they stop there and they say, well, look, he feeds the bird, so he's going to feed me. That's it. But they didn't end the hadith. They didn't continue. What did the Prophet ﷺ say in the next sentence? He says, That is the most important part of the hadith. He says, the bird leaves its nest early morning, going out in search for food and comes back in the evening with a full belly of food. That means if you lay your trust in Allah truly, you will make an effort. Like the bird makes an effort and Allah will sustain you with what is sufficient for you for that day. That's what the hadith means. And sometimes Allah's mercy, He gives you more than that. People have one business deal that can keep them going for a whole year. Subhanallah. But that's Allah. Who gave it to you? Allah. So let's not think for a moment that we should be people who lay our trust in Allah without putting into play what Allah has given us in terms of ability, limited ability. You must put it into play. So tawakul is when you lay your trust without tying the camel. And tawakul is when you lay your trust after having tied the camel. Bismillah, I locked my door. I, I armed the alarm and I walked into the market with my car locked and I said tawakkal to Allah. When I come back and I see that the window has been smashed and my belongings have been stolen, I say Alhamdulillah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. All praise is due to Allah. Indeed, we all belong to Allah and we're going to return to Him. I start off with praising Allah because now I know what happened. That was Allah's gift to me, Allah's blessing for me, testing me. We're going to take away from you. How are you going to react? That's what it is. So Allah says, we'll take away from you. How will you react? But for a person who refuses that and says, look, I will leave my windows open. My door won't be locked. Nothing can happen except by the will of Allah. You're fooling yourself by adding a, a false statement to a true statement. Subhanallah, as simple as ABC. We lock our doors at night, mashallah. What do we do? Lock it. And you know that they can break it. It's just a deterrent. They can damage it and destroy it in the flash of an, of an eye, you know, in the blink of an eye. But you know, I've laid my trust in Allah. And guess what? You read your Ayatul Kursi. You read your, what we call the three Quls, the Mu'awwidat and, Qul and Surat Al-Ikhlas and a few other Duas. And you sleep like a log until Salatul Fajr because you know you've left it in the hands of Allah. As a human, you did whatever was possible. Now, don't struggle with anxiety all night, tossing and turning. Did you not lay your trust in Allah? Yes. Did you do whatever you could? Yes. Now, have a good sleep. Subhanallah Rabbil Alameen. The same applies with sickness and disease. People are becoming anxious, struggling with anxiety. What's going to happen? What's not going to happen? I got it and I didn't get it and so on. Do you know what? If you're going to think that way, you're going to probably get more sick and ill than you should have. Subhanallah. And you are to blame because lay your trust in Allah. Did you not take a few precautions? Yes, we are humans. We cannot go beyond a certain point. We can only take a certain amount of proportion of precaution. And after that, you know what? If it's going to come to you, it will come to you. And if it does come to you at that point, say Alhamdulillah, Allah has given you a gift. He wants you to bear patience. And guess what? If Allah has written that these are going to be your last days, there's nothing you're going to do that's going to change that. But you need to go back to Allah, knowing that you're going to answer Allah to say, you tried your best to look after yourself with the capacity given to you by Allah. Like I said, limited capacity given to you by Allah. Allah says, how did you look after the amana of the body that I gave you? So you're going to say, I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't do anything that would harm my body. And when there was a plague, I took a few precautions to the best of my ability in a way that was not displeasing to you. And thereafter, it still got me. And after that, I still died. Subhanallah. If you, if you die having committed suicide, you will be questioned, why did you do that? But if you die without having played a role in it, or having done whatever you should have in order to protect yourself and you still died, you're never going to be questioned, why did you die?
Subhanallah. Why did you kill yourself? Because you didn't. Allah on the day of judgment is only going to ask you questions rotating around one thing. Wherever we gave you a choice, how did you use it? There's no other questions. We gave you a choice to get up for Fajr or not. You didn't get up. You didn't set your alarm. You were lazy. Why? If we didn't give you a choice, then Allah's not going to ask you about that. Things happening around you or with you that you have absolutely no choice regarding or no role to play. Allah's not going to ask you, why did you do that? Because he knows I didn't even give you a choice. Why were you born in this country? <laughs> That's not a question Allah's going to ask you because Allah didn't give you, you know, the choice in that regard. So remember my brothers and sisters, we lay our trust in Allah and Allah alone. We know whatever happens will happen only from Allah and whatever comes in our direction will definitely come if Allah has willed it and written it indeed. But let's not be foolish by using that statement, which is so true to be negligent and to be people who don't care and don't bother. Remember to turn to Allah. Remember to fulfill your duty unto Allah with the basics such as Salah, such as your dress code, such as the Quran, the dhikr of Allah. The remembrance of Allah. This morning I received a message from a brother who swears that what helped him was the recitation of Surah Al-Baqarah and listening to Surah Al-Baqarah when his fever was so high. And according to what he says, he says, I promise you that's what brought my fever down. Imagine the conviction. Beautiful. Imagine the yaqeen. Amazing. I'm sure he's taken other things and perhaps other medication and so on. But for him, what really worked was that Surah Al-Baqarah. Subhanallah. That's what would happen to us. If I make a dua to Allah before I take medication or even after I've taken the medication, I say, Oh Allah, I've taken this medication, but I trust you that you will, you will make this work on me and you will cure me by your cure. Allah will give you the cure. And I've told you that there are people diagnosed with the same disease, taking the same medication works on some does not work on some. The power of Allah. That's what it is. The Qudra. Believe in this Qudra. We are mu'minin. Nothing bad can happen to a true believer. Have you thought of it? Nothing bad can ever happen to a true believer. It's only good. That's confirmed in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. and his entire life. He never complained to Allah so much so that in Ta'if, he didn't take it as a bad thing. It was a good thing. Although for us, it was terrible. We would go to war for that. But the Prophet ﷺ, given the opportunity and the chance, he says, Oh Allah, my mission here is to deliver the message of yours to these people. Oh Allah, guide my people. They don't know what they're doing. Allahumma di qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamu. Oh Allah, guide my people. They don't know what they're doing. Oh Allah, if you haven't written guidance for them, written, uh, write it for their offspring. It worked. Did you know that at, at a time of calamity, at a time that is very trying and testing, the angels keep saying, Ameen, 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 waiting for you to open your mouth. Did you ever know that? In the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, make a good dua. The angels are saying, Ameen. So when suddenly you have a big accident, for example, if you're a person who hasn't had children for 10 years, as soon as that accident happens, you know, the angels are saying, I mean, say, oh Allah, bless me with offspring. People might think you're such a fool. You're not a fool. You're seizing the opportunity of an Ameen of the angels to make another dua that may not be connected to what exactly happened. But because you know, it's a calamity. It's a moment of duas being accepted. The angels are about to say, Ameen. The last thing you want to say is, oh, Shabbat, Allah protect us. It's a fact. We've been trained to say the worst of words. Something bad happens. We swear F's and B's. The angels are saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. What are you wasting that for? Why are you wasting it? Subhanallah. Don't waste it. Make dua. Minimum is Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ask Allah for goodness. And remember, that was planned by Allah. Unless you were foolish, it was still in the decree of Allah, but you are to blame. So the plan of Allah is always there. When you have had a role to play and you haven't played it, you are to blame. Allah will hold you accountable, responsible. That's the whole reason of creating Jannah and Jahannam. But if you have had no role to play, the decree of Allah will still come to pass, but in a way that you would not be held accountable for that particular thing because you had no role to play in it. La ilaha illallah. This is the balance that needs to be understood when it comes to tawakkul and tawakkul. A man comes to the messenger, sallallahu he says, I trust Allah completely, O messenger. Now, should I tie my camel and trust Allah? Or should I let my camel loose and trust Allah? The Prophet knows that whatever's going to happen to that camel is still going to happen anyway, because it's written, right? He says, Iqilha, thumma tawakkal ala Allah. Tie it, then say, I lay my trust in Allah. Simple hadith. Although the Prophet knew for a fact that nothing can ever happen to this camel except what Allah has written for it. He knew that. It did not negate the fact that you got to take that precaution. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to understand this. Now, let me continue a little bit further. You tried whatever you could, you did whatever you could, and you laid your trust in Allah, you made your dua, you did your Quran, you did your tilawa, you, uh, you cried at the time of tahajjud, uh, you, you did whatever you could, you became a good person, you repented to Allah, because my brothers and sisters, repentance brings about a lot of barakah and blessings. If the Quran has spoken about one act of worship that brings about almost anything and everything from the mercy of Allah, it is indeed definitely got to do with istighfar, seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now that you've done everything there, 
if my brothers and sisters calamity strikes understand Allah has said we will test you with so many things and calamity will strike and a lot of things will happen to you that you did not want to happen to you because life is a test when I speak to little children and even some of the youth and adults about life being a test they say how can you prove to me that Allah created us to test us well I always say there's a simple response to that nothing that's happening is happening according to your liking subhanallah everything that comes is according to the liking of Allah who you are is not even according to what you wanted it's what Allah wanted so when an examiner is asking you questions you don't have a role to play in preparing those questions it's from him you've no say in anything from that you know this is a test because if it was not a test Allah would have given me everything I wanted how I wanted he would have asked me before I was born to say hang on just choose where do you want to go you want to go here or there and where would you like to be you know subhanallah he never did that because he knows it's a test. We're only sending you for whatever reason he wants to test us. I may never understand fully why exactly he wants to test us, but I know he wants to give us Jannah and he wants us to go back to him. And when we meet him, we will know everything by the will of Allah. We don't, we know for a fact, sophisticated human beings also pass away. The most intelligent from amongst us also pass away. The top doctors from amongst us have gone. Subhanallah. May Allah grant us ease. So if calamity still strikes, you need to know that was a test from Allah. You need to pass the test. Don't ever question the decree of Allah. Thank Allah. Let it be a means of drawing you closer to Allah through all your ibadah and staying away from sin and engaging in istighfar. Still become a better person. And you need to know daybreak only follows the darkest hours of the night. You've lost your job. You don't know where the next morsel is going to come from. It's okay. You're not the first person that that is happening to, and you're not going to be the last person that that is happening to. You need to adjust your life. You need to make sure you've prepared for a rainy day. And at the same time, if push comes to shove, Allah will grant you do your best. Allah will open your doors. I've met a lot of people who've said we've adjusted our lifestyle. Alhamdulillah, good news to you. My brother, my sister, it is nothing to be embarrassed about when you need to sell your motor vehicle. You might need to sell your house in order to live in rented accommodation for a while. If you are too embarrassed to do that, you are the one who's going to struggle. But if it's come to that very sadly from a human perspective, there is sadness. But from a spiritual religious perspective, there is excitement. If Allah wanted this from me, Alhamdulillah. When I was much younger, I visited one of my ustads, one of my lecturers who had lost a leg in an accident in the hospital. And I remember standing around and they were asking him what happened. And he says, Alhamdulillah, I lost my leg. It was amputated. Alhamdulillah. And you know, I felt at that moment and not just me, a few others also that I think he's saying the wrong word. You know, when you're young and you don't know and someone's just lost a leg and they say, Alhamdulillah, I lost my leg. And you think, is this guy crazy? He's supposed to say, Astaghfirullah, I lost my leg. Or he's supposed to say something else, you know, but he says, Alhamdulillah. So we asked him why, why Alhamdulillah? He says, I've used this leg to walk to the masjid for 35 years. I don't know how many years, but for so many years. And in, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me this organ that I've never used to disobey him. And he took it away when its time was up. I thank Allah for that. He didn't allow me to do haram with this before he took it away. La ilaha illa. Imagine the type of yaqeen this man's got. Imagine the type of connection with Allah he's got. A leg you lost. Well, he said to us, you know what? I could get another one. I could get a, uh, you know, one of those artificial limbs and it will be connected and we'll walk with it at one stage. It's not like it's the end of the world. How many of us are ready to accept what has struck us with such positivity? If you do, you will still lead a life up to the point of your death. But the only thing is the quality of it will improve tremendously because your connection with Allah has improved the quality of your life. If you're going to be depressed about it and you're in bed and you're embarrassed to meet people because of this that happened to you and you're so you will you are the one who's going to struggle with all sorts of difficulty and hardship. The barakah is snatched away from your life simply because you didn't surrender to what Allah has chosen for you. Some people, if Allah gives them wealth, they would turn away from the deen and others, if Allah makes them poor, they would turn away from the deen. And the opposite is true. Some people, when Allah takes away from them, they get closer to him. And some people, when Allah gives them, they get closer to him. So Allah says in the Quran that all human beings have a different path that they will tread upon. Allah makes easy for them to tread upon the certain path, a path of goodness. May Allah make it easy for us to tread upon a path of ease in a way that our relationship with him is at its best. And our life on earth is also beautiful and smooth sailing to a great degree. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار Oh Allah, and this is the best dua you could make. Oh Allah, oh our Rabb, grant us goodness in this world, goodness in the hereafter. That's what man wants. Man wants goodness everywhere he goes. Oh Allah, give me the best here. Give me the best there. Allah will give you by the will of Allah. Sometimes Allah knows that something you don't think is the best for you is actually the ultimate best for you. And something you think is good for you is not at all good for you. So he either gives or doesn't give based on his love for you and his connection, your connection with him actually. 
And it wouldn't be wrong for us to say his connection with you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in a hadith Qudsi, whoever comes to me a little bit, I come to him even more. Whoever comes to me a hand span, I come to him a whole foot. Whoever comes to me walking, I come to him rushing. I will always give you more than what you've asked from me. Subhanallah. You connect with Allah, Allah connects with you. And one hadith that's actually really made me ponder. Amazing, amazing hadith. Where the Prophet ﷺ told his companions, he says, you know, Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqa'ahu. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Whoever loves and is looking forward to the meeting with Allah, Allah is looking forward to the meeting with him or her. Amazing. Whoever is looking forward to the meeting with Allah. Have you thought of meeting with Allah? Have you thought of meeting him? Have you thought of going back to him? Have you thought of talking to him? Subhanallah. If you're looking forward to the meeting with Allah, guess what? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, Allah is looking forward to the meeting with you. How? How? Amazing. I can't believe, meaning we believe it is a hadith, but I, if a man imagine a, a VV VIP and you're a nothing compared to that person, this is just an example, and you're looking forward to meeting them and they're looking forward to meeting you. The excitement is the other way. Because who am I? I'm a nothing man. Imagine Allah, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى The example of Allah is always higher. Whatever we've just said is obviously only to bring you closer to the minds of the people. But when that happens and Allah is looking forward to meeting with you, imagine, I can't, you know, I sit and I think about it and I tell myself, imagine a large crowd of people and you picked up from that particular crowd and you taken forward and you brought to Allah. And Allah says, I was looking forward to meeting you. I know how much of salah you did for me. I know how much you worshipped me, how much you trusted me, how much you endured from what I put in your path. Here is your Jannah, Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant it to us. The calamities of this world will continue until the world comes to an end itself. The world will come to an end. Everything will come to an end. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will reward you. Take it in your stride. Don't lose hope. It's not the end of everything. No. What's the worst case scenario for people? For us as human beings who are weak, we say, well, the worst thing is I might die. That's actually the best thing for a believer. Tuhfatul mu'min al mawtu. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the gift of a true believer is death. Imagine when you die after having led a life of obedience to Allah, trying, you're a human, don't forget you're a human being. You will falter, but you will also repent immediately and make amends regarding your relationship with Allah. And then guess what? The day you pass on, if you started that day with Salatul Fajr, may Allah strengthen us. If you started that day with Tilawa of the Quran, with goodness, with a good plan and so on and come 10 o'clock and you just pass away, do you really think you're going to go to an evil place, a bad place, or you're going to be the happiest soul ever, ever, ever? Subhanallah. Eternity, we all have to go. Don't let these temporary trials of the dunya distract you. Don't. May Allah strengthen all of us. My brothers and sisters, if you have people who are sick and ill, or if you are unwell, do whatever you can. But don't ever remove Allah from that equation. Call out to Allah, make dua to Him, ask Him, connect yourself with the Quran, connect yourself with Allah, go to sujood, take your time in sujood. And you know what? Allah will calm you down. And you need to know ultimately, your time of returning to Allah is fixed. There's no chance that that's going to change. Even if this virus had not come onto this earth, your time is your time. You were going to go anyway, be it a heart attack, be it a murder, be it whatever else it may have been, you were going to go. There is a silver lining to all of this. And that is those who have passed on with, a, with this virus, inshallah, they would be considered martyrs because we're totally helpless. We're watching and witnessing. We're seeing. And subhanallah, life is just being snatched away in front of our eyes. You're a believer. You surrender to Allah. Allah says, I'll give you Jannah. And for a martyr, resurrected with a certain category of people, with the other martyrs, with the other friends of Allah, with the companions, with the messengers, with those who were truthful, those whom Allah loves. I always think of Hajj. I've made Hajj quite a few times. And normally the general public, all of us, we walk in and we wait our turn and we stand in the queues and we actually have so much to do. And there are millions of people usually, and we're just one in, in a few million, two, three million, sometimes more. Imagine if you were, subhanallah, someone who was given preferential treatment just in this world. And you had your own little system with your own little bubble of people and you had to go separately and you were okay and people watch hey what's happening to this guy here and you just you just stay through everything's happening you would feel relatively important may allah protect us i say protect us from pride haughtiness but you would feel important imagine the day of judgment and imagine it often if you want that status it's not so difficult you just need to be the best possible version of yourself as a mu'min as a believer 
and Allah will grant that to you. Allah will give you something amazing. Allah will make you a VIP on that day of judgment. There's a special area, a special area that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi speaks about on the day of judgment where it's going to be very, very hot. The sun will be so close to the heads of the humankind that they're going to be drowning in their sweat. But there's going to be a special area which will be shaded by Allah himself. And certain categories of people will be there. Strive to be from among at least one of those categories. You might want to research more about that particular hadith. The hadith of the seven categories of people who will be granted the shade of the day of judgment. May Allah grant us that particular shade. I mean, so my brothers and sisters, I pray that we can enforce and reinforce our trust in Allah and we understand the plan of Allah and we understand it obviously to a degree that He has explained it to us that we have a role to play and still that does not negate that we trust Allah completely, completely. And let's not insult Allah by engaging in what is known as tawakul. Like I explained, tawakul is to say, I lay my trust in Allah, but that is a false trust because we have not played the simple limited role that Allah has asked us to play. That would be insulting to Allah. Imagine Allah tells you, I gave you the energy, I gave you the capacity, I gave you this, I gave you that. You had a lock on the door, you had everything, you left the door wide open and you're telling me, look after this thing here. Couldn't you just lock that door and say the same thing? That's the meaning of that hadith of the camel and the tying of it where it was simple for the Prophet to say, never mind, don't tie it, just lay your trust in Allah. Isn't it? It's very strong. Oh, it's powerful. The man says, my trust in Allah is solid. What should I do? This or that? So the Prophet clearly told him, tie it, then lay your trust in Allah. May Allah help us all. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu